Let me just highlight this idea of might. Well, wait a minute. You guys said you were the experts. You guys have been claiming now for generations that you know all the answers. Your science has settled all these things. Seems to me like you're still winging it. You're still guessing. In, in all these years, you've been in the don't repress camp because Freud was in the don't repress camp, but now you've got some studies saying, well, wait a minute, maybe, you know what? There could be a value to holding it in. There could be a value to not regurgitating it. The point is, they don't know. And their own literature proves the liars that they are. They don't know. And we're going to see this again and again and again throughout this chapter and on in chapter 6. So it might be an undervalued coping skill, okay? For that reason, laughter, optimism, and inappropriate seeming positive emotions should not be simply stigmatized as denial. For decades now, people have been mocked and urged, they've been told, oh, you're in denial. Come on, get it off your chest, get it out there. You have to be sad. And if, you, if you're not, if you dared to say, well, I know that, that my loved one's in heaven, I know that I have the hope of eternal life, and, well, you're in denial, that's just not normal. You can't know that, you're just, you've bought into this God delusion. Now, the literature, their own literature, these are their studies. These aren't believers. These are unbelievers. These are, this, these are the, the, the research studies in this field. And they're starting to say, well, maybe optimism's not, not a bad thing. We, we, we shouldn't just point at it and say it's always um, denial. Okay? All right. The belief that talking about troubles and expressing one's negative feelings are beneficial undergirds all kinds of counseling. It fills all the, the secular counseling that's out there, and it fills all the biblical counseling that's out there. Remember the three uh, examples that we read last, last time, two weeks ago? All three. Were there any of those three models that didn't, that didn't explore this? They all did. And the ones beyond the three examples we had as well. All right. Nevertheless, the research simply does not support that idea. We know that considerable research dealing with what is called post-traumatic stress disorder indicates that those who receive treatment do no better than those who don't. So you got two soldiers coming back from a, a combat theater. And there are some, and they both saw horrible things while they were there, all right? And, and I was there, and I saw it when I was there. But you see stuff, and you come back. What are you going to do about it when you come back? What are you going to do with the horrible things you've seen? Well, some went under treatment. Others didn't go under treatment. Both control groups were, were surveyed. Both control groups were monitored. There were studies that were done on these control groups. Those who receive treatment do no better than those who don't. And a significant number of people treated do even worse than those who did not receive treatment. Well, what number is that? Is it 10% do worse? 20% do worse? Well, what is the number? See, well, in my mind, of course, when you're using satanic methodology for soul stability, um, that right there is your first mistake. But this is their research. Reporting on the extensive research, the writer says, the negative reaction seems to emerge because for some people, the very act of focusing on their negative feelings increases their distress and leads to more difficulties, such as flashbacks, nightmares, and anxiety attacks. Now, that may be true for some people. For others, it may not be. You realize that we're all different? Wow. <laughs> There's a news flash for you. Um, and you don't have to spend millions of dollars researching that. And the amazing thing is these experts that say they know how the mind works, are you kidding me? Even if you could figure out how one human mind worked, okay, start there, and you've still got seven more billion to go on the planet today. We're all different. And of course, there'll be things, some things in common, trends and whatnot. 
But who knows each one of us personally, individually, intimately? God does. The Lord does. That's who we need to rely on, not these experts that are, when you read their own literature, they're still, they're still trying to figure things out. While most problem-centered counseling does not deal with post-traumatic stress syndrome, most counseling does involve the very act of focusing on negative feelings. Hey, let's bring this up again next week. Hey, next week, let's talk about how your dad beat you again. Let's talk about that for the next 12 sessions. <laughs> you know, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is true, whatever is lovely, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Okay? <laughs> Dwelling in darkness, what does that accomplish? Do we, have, do we have sanction from Scripture to let our mind dwell in darkness? I don't find any. Focusing on negative feelings. This research conclusion about PTSD should by extension raise serious questions about problem-centered counseling. The evidence regarding PTSD definitely relates to the negative aspect of talking about problems, as in problem-centered counseling. Such emphasis and emotional expression have been shown to be detrimental to those who seek relief by rehearsing, rehashing, reliving, and regurgitating their problems. I love that. Well written. Such emphasis on problems and negative emotional expression not only bode badly for the individual, but pose potential harm to the relationships with others. We believe that the rapid rise of marriage counseling since World War II with a focus on problems Negative feelings and tell-it-all milieu has been one of the major contributors to the rising divorce rate. Well, you create an entire industry that's designed to uh, dig up all the reasons why you're not happy and all the things you can't stand about this guy and what he's got to change. You think there's some kind of effect? And when you can track the statistics, all right, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but um, much of what we're studying, much of what we're reading in this material is strictly an American phenomenon, okay? Pretty much the decadent West, okay? I'm talking about America and decayed Western Europe. Most of the rest of the world doesn't uh, spend time, you know, navel gazing and uh, all the rest. All right. Too many individuals, including believers, have been drastically deceived by the siren call to express all, in spite of the many biblical admonitions to the contrary. Things that ought not be spoken. You know, let your speech always be seasoned as with salt. I mean, should we not be careful about what we say? Is the tongue not a fire? All right. Wonderful documentation on what happened shortly after World War II and how it went from uh, clinical laboratories uh, and how it exploded, um, how it entered into pop culture. We talked about a couple chapters ago it was the influence of women's magazines and other things that introduced terms into the, into the home about subconscious and ego and all this sort of stuff. Um, but the real issue that happened here was the funding that was absconded. And entire departments in college faculties that found that this was a source of research because the Pentagon was researching this. All right? And so um, the real surge of problem-centered counseling called psychotherapy was when, after World War II, the federal government poured large sums of money into clinical psychology programs at universities in order to train counselors. The book called The Practice of Psychology. Now, I don't own that book. I did a little bit of research on it. Uh, I found uh, the authors and, and did that. Um, I kind of decided I'm not going to take the time to hunt it down, to spend the money to purchase it, to buy it. I, I think the... Um, excerpts in here are representative and I, I don't feel like I need to read that as a source. Um, but here's what they point out, the Veterans Administration. 
as an agency of the federal government became a major source of funding for the training of psych uh, psychologists and psychiatrists. In the short order, uh, in, or in short order, psychology training programs at the college and university level, which had previously suffered from a severe lack of financial support and student interest, now found an abundance of both. They found an abundance of both. It was out of these clinical psychology departments that professional counselors began to be trained. But then there were some changes that had to happen because initially everybody was an, an MD and all the schooling that was required to get a medical doctor degree. And they were actually psychiatrists, which was additional schooling on top of the medical schooling. And they were bringing their patients in three days a week multiple sessions every week to get comprehensive journals and comprehensive notes and thorough documentation of all these theories and things they were exploring. And in a way, there was at least some form of journaling, if you want to call that research. It wasn't really science, but it was logging, it was journaling, it was uh, exploring of, of consistent uh, approaches with the same people three days a week for weeks and months and years at a time. Well, all that got thrown out. What happened was a tug of war between clinical research and uh, counseling practice. And counseling practice with the one hour a week session with non-doctors, with psychologists rather than psychiatrists, and a, a huge change there that took place. All right. Anyway, this all gets described down here. It's interesting, even, um, even as late as 1970, George Alby, then president of the American Psychological Association, was quoted in Psychology Today as predicting the death of clinical psychology in his presidential address. Titled, The Short Unhappy Life of Clinical Psychology, Rest in Peace. He didn't think it would take off. He felt that it would very quickly return back into the into the, uh, you know, the very sheltered cloisters of, of where it had been prior. Excuse the pun, but he was dead wrong, all right? <laughs> anyway, Martin's got a wonderful sense of humor. If we ever have a blessing to be able to bring him and Deidre here, uh, you'll, you'll gather that very quickly. All right. Hmm. The triumph of the therapeutic mentality which insisted upon seeing the immemorial questions of human life as problems that require solutions. Isn't that something? That's a, that's a real attitude shift right there on a societal level. Therapists uh, transformed age-old human dilemmas into psychological problems and you've got to be cured. You're sick. It's got to be fixed. Instead of for centuries, people just realize it's called life. You have problems. Okay? And if you're a believer, you find God's provision to deal with your problems. If you're an unbeliever, you turn wherever you turn. They've been doing that forever. Well, now all of a sudden, problems aren't problems anymore. Now they're syndromes, they're sicknesses, they're disease. They're, it's not normal. Normal is no problems. And so with the right counseling, with the right drugs, you can have no problems. Okay? I haven't spoken about the drugs as much. We'll, we'll address a little bit of that tonight. So there's a real shift of thinking. I would even put forth, a lot of it came about, I think, uh, as uh, Darwinianism was, was taking hold and people were starting to think of more things as medical instead of spiritual. Uh, pregnancy became a medical event instead of, a, instead of a, a, yeah, a normal family event. Having a baby was considered normal, now it's considered medical. Other things. Anyway, uh, definitely a demonic century there at the end of the 19th century, first part of the 20th century. Let me skip down through. I want to get to the other big items or we won't have time. During the past 50 years, there's been a dramatic shift in confidence on the part of Christians. This is the sad thing. I mean, unbelievers, they've been doing what they've been doing, but for believers to go down this road is sad. A shift in confidence away from the sufficiency of God's word for problems of living and towards man's wisdom, the wisdom of man. Oh, I don't have a sin issue. I don't need to repent. I just have an imbalance. 